Thanks for coming out. Um, uh, I haven't uh, actually been single-handedly uh, kind of um, reviving uh, uh, whatever we want to call the affordable housing field's interest in manufactured housing. I have a, a lot of um, help along the way, including one of my good friends, Paul Bradley, who's sitting here in the front row. And you'll hear about some of Paul's work, and I'll probably enlist Paul to answer a few questions about some of the stuff we did in the sector. But um, I have to say that uh, I think uh, I, I'll speak for Paul. Um, given the, um, the challenges we've had of getting um, housers interested in manufactured housing, it's quite extraordinary that we actually filled the room here today. Um, in 2002, when Paul and I first started on uh, this initiative, we actually, uh, working with NeighborWorks America, we uh, put together a symposium on manufactured housing in which we invited oh, several thousand uh, people working for community development corporations, nonprofit housers around the world, um, around the U.S. And, um, we uh, uh, half filled the room and we couldn't even find enough people doing actual work with manufactured housing in the nonprofit sector to fill three panels. So um, it's, uh, it's interesting that uh, this has now evoked uh, so much more interest and it's, uh, it's actually heartwarming. All right, so I'm going to tell you, you know, a, a little, a, a long story with a, with a kind of a personal kind of journey here and it all started about uh, 15 years ago when I was uh, recruited to come to the Ford Foundation to um, develop a new program for them around uh, using home ownership as a means to help low-income families build wealth. At the time, the Ford Foundation had been working for about oh, 30, 40 years in the, um, in the anti-poverty work and their urban poverty work uh, focused almost solely on uh, rental housing and building affordable rental housing. But they adopted a new approach, their anti-poverty approach called this, the assets approach, which said that if you really wanted to make durable changes in people's lives, uh, then what you should do is help them to build wealth and not just transfer income from year to year. So um, with um, you know, uh, some interest, I came to help um, start the program. And then I had to uh, suffer the slings and arrows of every affordable housing practitioner in the world who said that the Ford Foundation is now throwing rental, uh, rental housing under the bus. I, which we actually did. So, um, it was, so it was true, but nonetheless, it was, um, it was just the way things happen. Um, anyway, so um, when I came to Ford and I started to think about the challenges of using home ownership to build wealth, one of the first things I did is I reached out to an old friend of mine uh, who's uh, since passed away, Cushing Dolbear, who worked for the National Low Income Housing Coalition. And I just asked Cushing to give me um, a little bit of data on where low-income homeowners lived in the U.S. And uh, she uh, went to the American Housing Survey and pulled down some tables for me and showed me kind of the distribution of low-income homeowners, what, where they live, what they lived in. And I was absolutely astounded to see the proportion of low-income homeowners who lived in manufactured housing. And I was actually astounded to see the, the, the scale of the sector. It just absolutely surprised me. I'd been working in housing at that point for about 20 years. And I just had always kind of assumed that manufactured housing was some niche thing, there were a small number of houses that were, was kind of insignificant in the, in the face of things. Um, and yet I found out that it was actually kind of a gigantic share of the housing stock and an even larger share of the affordable housing stock. So um, I went and I enlisted the uh, consumer union. Well, uh, well back up a, a second. So I started talking to people in the field about manufactured housing. They said, look, Mac, you're trying to help people build wealth. Why would you be talking about manufactured housing? Because everybody knows that manufactured housing is an asset of diminishing value. And in fact, when you look the way people actually tried to assess the value of manufactured housing at the time, they used a blue book like you use in, um, um, to value automobiles. <laughs> uh, because in many ways, everybody was still considering uh, manufactured housing mobile homes. And you know, they had been called mobile homes before 1976. And somehow assumed that because they're mobile homes, they're actually mobile. That's another thing I found out, they're not that mobile. <laughs> So um, anyway, so uh, I, I actually then, uh, well, first I asked Cushing, I said, just can you take a look and tell me, is it really true that manufactured housing is always a, an asset of diminishing value? And she came back and she said, you know, Mac, it's actually about a third of manufactured housing has been appreciating. But I can't actually explain why. I just can de detect that in the data. So I went and asked the consumer union to do um, some more in-depth study for me. And they actually uh, not only found out um, um, how manufactured housing could appreciate, but they were able to kind of um, unpack it for us and give us some uh, insights into how we might be able to intervene in the sector to make it a better option for people to build wealth. 
So then, um, you know, I was kind of talking to some of the folks at the Ford Foundation. I was in the process of building this new initiative. And one of my colleagues who used to work in Vermont said, hey, Mac, you're interested in manufactured housing. You should go talk to these people in New Hampshire. I think I, I seem to remember they're doing some important stuff there. Maybe you should see what they're up to. So out of the blue, I called a guy named Paul Bradley, who was running uh, the manufactured housing initiative at the New, New Hampshire Community Loan Fund. And I said, but Paul, would you mind if I kind of come up and kick the tires, see what's going on up there. I hear some interesting stuff going on up there. And Paul, ever the entrepreneur, said, oh yeah. And he, he put together this, uh, this tour for me of manufactured housing and, uh, and a complete uh, analysis, at least from the point of view of people in New Hampshire, about the, um, about the sector. And then he brought me to sit at the table of um, one of their newest uh, kind of acquisitions, a, 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 a manufactured home community that they converted to resident ownership to meet uh, Lois uh, Paris, who was um, a diminutive four foot 11 woman who um, just shined in her kitchen and told me all about her transformation from being kind of a um, you know, stigmatized member of her community to now being someone who is managing a multi-million dollar asset. And uh, she also kind of introduced me to the community there and I was stunned to see just the quality of neighborhood that you would encounter in a manufactured housing community, which more than rivaled, but actually surpassed the, what would I consider the kinds of neighborhood characteristics you would want in a place like uh, the suburbs or in the city. And I said, wow, this is actually quite important. This is something I should take seriously. So I sat down with Paul and I said, well, what are we gonna do? And so that's where the story starts. So this is what I'm gonna tell you today. I'm gonna introduce you to manufactured housing because I'll give you some facts that maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but when I encountered them, I found them to be quite stunning. And I've, um, actually, I, I pulled out of the mothballs a presentation I did in 2003 about this initiative, and I've updated the data. But I'm, I was actually stunned as I was going through it to see just how much of the stuff we planned to do in 2003 we actually got done, which is quite amazing, right? <laughs> so then I'm also going to talk a little bit about sectoral theory. I don't know if you know much about it, but it was, it's one of, the, one of these kind of, it was a, kind of one of those sexy things people were doing in the, in the early 2000s to kind of, uh, fix broken markets, uh, particularly in the workforce development field. But we decided to apply the sectoral theory to manufactured housing, and it was a good call. Um, Paul and I decided that we could um, really find a way to organize a whole bunch of different actors to kind of really take on the sector. And then um, I want to talk about what we did, how we, how we actually started, and it's still ongoing work, but, but we've actually made gigantic strides in transforming that sector into a housing solution and not something that people look at as part of the problem anymore. And I'll just describe some of the key accomplishments of some of our other players in the field. All right, so in the 1990s, manufactured housing accounted for two-thirds of all the affordable housing built in the United States. And from uh, 1990 to, to 2010, over a course of 20 years, 21% of all new single-family homes were manufactured housing. Uh, and 43% of homes that, were, uh, that cost less than $150,000. It's a lot of housing. Who, who lives in that housing? Well, 74% of their owners earn less than $50,000. And the median income of manufactured housing owners is around $29,000. And this was whatever 2012 numbers. And compared to site-built homes, this is really important. Manufactured housing, the construction cost is less than half. It costs $41 a square foot, and this is in 2010 versus $84 a square foot for just the, the hard cost of construction of site-built homes. The production time is 80% shorter. It takes um, a lot less time to build, and it generates about 35-40% uh, less waste in the production process because it's contained. It's in a factory. It's in a, it's in a setting that you can actually um, recycle and reuse lots of material that otherwise would just get thrown away on the job site. A lot of people think that this is only housing that exists in um, rural areas, uh, out, in the, out in the boonies. But in fact, 5% of the housing stock in U.S. metropolitan areas is manufactured housing. And it's about 15% of rural housing, so it's, you know, it's certainly concentrated more in the rural areas. But almost half of the manufactured housing stock, 47%, is in the suburbs. It's about 4 million units of housing. 8% in central cities. That's, uh, I think, pretty significant. And once cited, 80 plus percent of manufactured homes never move. And even the tw of the 18 or 19 percent that do move, some of them are just moving from where they are to the landfill. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's not what we consider to be a mobile housing stock anymore.